Awareness, hosted by the Physical and Mental Health Committee. My name is Dr. Dela Morris, and I am the chapter president of the Vallejo Alumni Chapter. I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's conversation. This will be a first in many discussions on intimate partner violence awareness. I'd like to advise you that Delta Sigma Theta has long advocated for local, state, federal, and international policies to prevent violence against girls and women and hold pre predators of intimate partner violence accountable. Delta chapters, along with Vallejo Alumni Chapter, will continue to advocate for the passage of laws designed to address violence against women and girls. Tonight, we have Naomi Ford, who is a certified para paralegal and youth organizer with Family Violence Law Center, and Rosalind Gentry, a licensed clinical social worker, who will provide us with a wealth of information. So please sit back, take notes, and if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will address questions at the end of the presentation. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Naomi Ford. Thank you. Hello. Um, so I'm going to give an overview um, of intimate partner violence and gender-based violence. Um, so I want to start by giving a content warning. Um, some content in this presentation um, may be emotionally challenging as we're talking about violence. So I just want to give a blanket statement and let everyone know um, to take care of themselves um, and make sure we're also prioritizing um, our mental health. And if you need to drop off the call, that's totally um, understandable. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. Um, this is the agenda. We'll do defining abuse, how to support loved ones in harmful relationships, um, what you can do to end gender-based violence. So to start, what is intimate partner violence? Um, so it's a pattern of abusive behavior used by one partner to gain or maintain power and control over the other. So this can be physical, verbal, emotional, sexual, and digital abuse. Um, and it's also known as sometimes as domestic violence. Um, gender-based violence refers to harmful acts directed at an individual based on their gender. So it's rooted in gender inequality, the abuse of power, and harmful norms. Um, and anyone can be impacted by gender-based violence. So women, men, and gender non-conforming people um, and it can show up in a lot of different ways, such as like forced prostitution, forced pregnancy, intimate partner violence, teen dating violence, um, sexual violence, and more. Um, and GBV is also directly related to larger forms of violence as well, like state violence um, in the case of police brutality. Um, and all of these like larger forms of state violence then trickle down um, into inner part or intimate partner violence. Um, so these are some of the types of abuse. Um, so there's physical, which is the one that most people think of when you think of abuse. Um, so that includes hitting, kicking, choking. Um, it can also be physical intimidation. So like restraining somebody, um, blocking movements or exits, throwing things at someone or near someone, punching walls. Those are all included in um, physical abuse. There is verbal and emotional, which is the use of threats name calling, insults, um, uh, um, offensive language. Um, it can also be intimidation or getting other people to threaten or intimidate um, somebody and also using electronic devices to harass, threaten or intimidate. Um, there is sexual abuse, which is for sexual contact. So that could be rape, attempted rape, um, any forced genital contact. Um, and that also includes inappropriate sexual behavior. So um, unwanted sexual contact, sexual battery, um, unwanted kissing, touching, um, anything like that is also sex sexual abuse. Um, and then there is economic abuse or financial abuse, which involves controlling finances 
or withholding money, damaging credit, um, and forcing victims to purchase things for the abuser. Um, there is digital abuse, which is something that is um, obviously becoming more prevalent um, with the internet age and like how things are developing. So that includes non-consensual image sharing, which is sharing someone's images without their consent. Um, it also be made like, and also be made referred to as um, revenge porn. Um, and then there's cyberbullying, which is using technology to harass, embarrass, threaten another person. There's sexual harassment, um, which obviously is included in sexual abuse, but also like digital if it's online. Um, so any unwanted sexual comments, messages, um, any attention like that. And then sextortion, which is um, a form of black male where someone threatens to share a nude or sexual image or video of you unless you give in to their demands. Um, so digital is one that is on the rise and that's happening um, pretty often right now. Um, and then there's mental and psychological abuse, which is when an abuser tries to distort their victim's sense of reality. Um, so that also includes convincing victims that they're crazy or incompetent or like distorting facts to purposely try to undermine somebody. Um, also like gaslighting, that's a word that people are using a lot now and that's a form of mental and psychological abuse. Um, and this is the cycle of harm, the cycle of abuse. Um, so this cycle is not necessarily, you don't necessarily always hit every single point on this cycle. Um, you might switch between a few of these things, but essentially the tension builds. So stress begins to grow in the relationship from points of conflict, daily life, things like that. The abusive incident occurs and it could be any of those types of abuse that I just listed. Um, then it's the honeymoon phase where the abuser apologizes, shows remorse, begs for forgiveness. Um, and then there's the calm. Um, and so the abuser may continue to act for, ask for forgiveness and make positive gestures. Um, but then over time, those start to reduce in sincerity. Um, and then it goes back to the tension builds. But like I said, it's not always, the cycle of abuse is not always all of these points. Like sometimes it's just tension builds, abusive incident, tension builds, abusive incident you know, and that never gets to the honeymoon or phase or the calm. Um, but partner abuse is a systematic pattern of behaviors, right? So it's something that's constantly happening um, and it's non-consensual. So it's somebody using their power, which could be either power in the relationship or social power to try to control like the thoughts, feelings, beliefs of somebody else. Um, so, in the cycle of harm, like obviously both the harm doer or the abuser and the person experiencing harm or their survivor are both going through their own versions of this cycle. Um, and on average, it takes survivors up to seven times, seven attempts before they're able to leave um, a harmful relationship or abusive relationship or the cycle of abuse. Um, so that could be seven abusive incidents before someone um, is able to leave. And in order to leave, it takes a lot of community support um, and it takes a lot of attempts. And so leaving the cycle is not a destination, but um, it's a process that happens over time. So these are an examples of some warning signs. Um, that you might see if someone is experiencing harm in an abusive relationship. So if they're worried about upsetting their partner, if they make excuses for their partner's harmful behavior, um, they're taking blame for things that are not theirs to have blame for, um, their mood is changing, their partner is possessive or jealous, um, they might be experiencing threats from their partner, maybe their partner's calling them like a million times in a row, um, they have like evidence of bruises and scars and scratches that they're trying to cover up. Um, like the partner may threaten to harm them. You might even see like something, right? So these are some of the warning signs um, to be on the lookout for if you think that someone is in a harmful relationship. And then these are some warning signs on the flip side, if you think someone may be causing harm in their relationship, right? So um, they may be moody and have emotional outbursts. Um, 
unwilling to hear any criticism or feedback or take accountability for any of their actions. Um, they might downplay their partner's feelings. Um, maybe you hear them say unkind things about their partner a lot. Um, you might hear them putting their partner down. They are very jealous or possessive. Um, they're super controlling. They think that um, they get to decide how their partner acts or looks or behaves. Um, so those are things to like look out for and be mindful for, um, for someone who might be someone who could cause harm in a relationship. Um, and then we have how to support loved ones. So some of the things that are important are reaching out first. Um, a lot of people in abusive relationships are feel fearful to reach out um, because of judgment, um, embarrassment, the stigma around being in a harmful relationship. So it's important to reach out first, um, to listen patiently and acknowledge the person's feelings. So maybe they're saying, oh, I love them. I really wanna be with them. Um, so to acknowledge that, okay, yes, you, you maybe you do love them, right? And not telling them what to do and allowing them to make their own decisions, which can be really hard when someone who we love and care about is in a harmful relationship. It can be hard to tell to like not tell them you deserve better, this is what you should do. Um, but it is much more helpful to be open-minded and not non-judgmental in approaching those conversations. Um, you can connect your friend to community resources, which we'll have listed um, in this presentation, um, encouraging them to participate in activities outside of the relationship. So that could be like setting a standing date with your friend or your um, whoever your loved one is to say every Sunday we meet for lunch at twelve thirty at this place, right? So that's encouraging them to like, okay, you you know that on Sundays you're gonna see me and we have this. You know that on Wednesdays we walk around the lake. You know that on Tuesdays we're um, going to a workout class. So like encouraging them to participate in other activities um, and like having that schedule is also really helpful for people who are stuck in that cycle. Um, and then helping them develop a safety plan. So a safety plan is about brainstorming ways to stay safe um, and that ways that also might redu reduce future harm. Um, so that can look like for someone in a harmful relationship, that can look like where can you go after an abusive incident? Um, who can you call? Do you have a bag that's ready to go if you need to leave? Um, do you know where all your important documents are in case you do decide to leave? Um, is your location turned off on your phone um, if you leave? Like things like that. Um, do you know where your keys are? Do you have a way to get out of your house if you need to? Do you have a ride here? Like making sure that all those steps are in place um, to let them know that if they do decide to leave, here is a plan and here is what I can do to support you. And even if they don't, if there is another abusive incident, like these are things that you can do to try to reduce the harm um, and to try to keep yourself safe in future incidents. Um, some of, These are some things that are not helpful to say when helping a friend. So victim blaming, um, putting the blame for mistreatment onto the person who has been harmed. So saying things like, why didn't you leave? What could you have done to prevent harm? Um, any judgment, like I would never be in that kind of situation. How could you allow that? That's so dumb. Um, or you should, or you shouldn't statements. So you shouldn't date them anymore. You should leave. You shouldn't have dated them in the first place. You should call the police. You should report them. Um, those statements are not helpful. Um, when someone is in that harmful relationship. Um, because like what we're trying to do is if we have loved ones who are in harmful relationships is to try to get them to get to the point where they feel strong enough to leave a situation on their own um, and not have to pull them out because that's has proven to not work and that can be super dangerous, right? Because if someone's in an abusive relationship, that's a very dangerous place to be. And we don't want to put them in more harm um, and like further isolate them by judging what they're doing or talking badly about their partner. Um, instead, just like trying to support them as best we can 
um, and let them know that we're here for them and they have a place to go um, at any time. So just like keeping that door open um, and like continuing to reach out, even if they're like trying to shut down, which can be extremely hard, but is one of the most helpful things to do in these types of situations. Um, and here are some statistics from the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. So one in three women and one in four men have experienced some form of physical violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Um, on a typical day, local domestic violence hotlines received approximately 19,159 calls. So that's about 13 calls every minute. One in six homicide victims are killed by an intimate partner. In 2018, domestic violence accounted for 20% of all violent crime. And um, since the pandemic in 2020, it has only increased. Um, at the time of the pandemic, when we were like in lockdown and things like that, that was a really um, hard time for a lot of people who were in harmful relationships because um, a lot of people lost their jobs. And so that's increased the rates of domestic violence um, at that time. Uh, victims also can experience mental health problems such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and can engage in risky behaviors such as smoking, binge drinking, and sexual risky behaviors. Um, IPV can also result in injury or death. So victims and or survivors face negative health outcomes such as conditions affecting their heart, reproductive system, nervous systems um, that can have long-term effects. So ending gender-based violence. The need to, enter, the need to end gender-based violence has never been more urgent. Um, California's governor, Governor Newsom, and legislator failed to invest in critical domestic and sexual violence prevention programs and services. Um, amidst disturbing rises in violence, when those in power fail to address and invest in solutions to gender-based violence, they are shrugging their shoulders at the 188% increase in domestic violence report agencies like the Family Violence Law Center have seen in just one year. Targeting both prevention and intervention across the lifespan is crucial to seeing any discernible improvement in the safety and health of our communities. However, we need funding to achieve this. 15 million ongoing investment in domestic and sexual violence that Governor Newsom rejected this year. We need our state and local elected officials, stakeholders and decision makers to once and for all memorialize the importance of gender-based violence prevention and intervention work in their budgets. Because at the end of the day, if a budget is our moral document, what do we want it to reflect about our shared commitment to survivors, their families, and communities? Um, I'm going to pass it to Sora Lake Pasqua, who is the co-chair of the Social Action Committee, um, to share what we can do to end gender-based violence. Thank you, Sora Ford. So if you're, you've listened to this information and thinking, what can I do? Um, and certainly um, it wouldn't be a Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated program if we didn't have a call to action. And so our immediate actions include um, researching um, the laws that you see here with the, appropriate, with the allocated dollars to support this very important work. And what we intend to do is to use our research to develop a template that we will email to the participants of this webinar um, that you can engage your local elected officials so that we can urge them to increase funding for domestic and sexual violence programs. Soar Ford. Thank you. Yes, um, and so what else you can do is refer give these resources to people, share them wide. Um, you, you know, we never know like who on our social media, um, in our group chat, anybody we know might be experiencing violence. Um, so to like just share these resources wide, um, we have the Family Violence Prevention um, for Solano County, the Family Justice Center Solano, um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, the phone number, as well as the text phone number, um, and then Safe Quest Solano. Um, for Alameda County, the Family Violence Law Center, which is where I work. Um, always happy to provide resources, open 24 seven, 365 days a year. Um, yes, so those are the resources. Um, 
And that is it for me, so. If I may, if, I may um, if we can go back to the slide with the resources. Yes. I'd want, I just wanna add and suggest that um, the participants of the webinar take note of the resources available because not only are these resources that you can use to refer to loved ones, these are resources that you as a concerned friend or family member can use for yourself as well. Uh, we've gone over a number of different ways and tidbits of information on things that you can do and you can that are harmful to do, but you may not retain it all. Um, you can access one of these resources for information on how you can help in your specific situation. So I just wanted to highlight the fact that these resources are useful not only to victims, but to people who are trying to support victims as well. Thank you so much, um, Rosalyn and Naomi. Thank you for an informative session on intimate partner violence. Um, we have a few questions. And so I wanna take this opportunity. Um, so uh, Naomi or Rosalyn, um, if you all would uh, answer these questions. Um, the first question is, why are men less likely than women to report being abused? Um, I would say it has to do with the stigma, um, the stigma around um, intimate partner violence um, is extremely high for women. And so for men, it's even higher. Um, and then I also think that maybe men think that there are not resources for them, right? Because maybe a lot of, there are a lot of organizations who have women in the name and whose main focus is women. Um, so I think sometimes men think like those resources are not for me or um, feel ashamed to come forward um, based on the stigma around um, intimate partner violence. Um, so I think those are some of the reasons why. Okay. Agree with Sora Ford mm -hmm. as well. And also just acknowledging um, that what they are experiencing is abuse. Okay. Um, so you highlighted a few things in your presentation about staying within uh, violent situations. Um, but I kind of want to go back to that. Why do people really stay in these relationships? Does it really have to do with um, what their friends or families are saying, or is it just that it becomes a norm? I think there's a number of reasons. I mean, we can cover some, but we'll never be able to capture all of the reasons. Um, there's a stabil an issue with stability. Um, the, the abuser may be the breadwinner, and so the victim may not have a means to support themselves outside of the relationship. Um, there could be an age differential where the victim sees the abuser as, you know, like the parent almost. And so there's a, a, a level of respect, for lack of a better term, that they have for their abuser and they look up to them in a way that they can't see themselves outside of that relationship. Um, there's some who have normalized the behavior that if they're not being harmed, then that's not, they're not receiving the love. So um, those are some of the reasons that I have been made aware of from victims. Um, there's fear, um, our access issues, uh, in terms of accessing resources, um, not feeling supported to leave, um, not feeling confident that if they leave that they will stay away. Um, and not understanding that, you know, even in making an attempt and you go back, that's better than, you know, staying. So those are some of the reasons that I would name. So Ford, do you have any additional? Um, yeah. So um, partner abuse is all about power and control, right? So um, it's something that is happening over time, slowly. And so I think um, or what I've seen and heard from people is that like it happens slowly and then all of a sudden they're like, whoa, I'm in this relationship and it got so far ahead of me 
that I can't even see a way out at this point. Um, so I think that when it happens slowly, like by little things of control and like little things and like start to isolate um, the person in the relationship um, and those things start to escalate over time. Um, and so like, I think people are able to rationalize it as like, well, it didn't start off like that. It was just like started this small thing. And then it's like, there was a small thing and then brush it off. And then next thing you know, you're in this harmful relationship and you don't have any friends and you don't know any resources and you feel trapped. Um, so from what I've seen, that's been um, what people have shared about like feeling trapped because it happened so slowly that they don't even realize it's happening. Okay. To um, that, you know, there was, I'm sorry, there was the diagram of the cycle mm -hmm. um, where the honeymoon and and sometimes the frequency is what um, people from leaving because it's not something they spend so much time in the calm and in the honeymoon and the frequency in which the incidents are occurring you know, it are just that, you know, it's been over two years since they've done this, you know, but then there's a lack of acknowledgement or recogni recognition that there may have been other things happening, even in the calm that yeah. could be deemed abusive as well, such as emotional or financial. So I think the frequency in which the physical act of abuse occurs also impacts the likelihood people are willing to, or victims are willing to lead their situations. Okay, thank you. Um, one of our um, our participants um, highlighted um, relationships where one of the uh, spouses or significant others may be suffering with dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, and so there may be appearance of verbal or mental abuse. Um, do we have any resources that we can share um, for individuals that are, are dealing with aged partners that, you know, the uh, illness is starting to appear more like abuse? Those resources could be available um, if the um, person who is experiencing dementia is receiving any kind of support services through um, Health and Human Services. That's a resource that that um, family member or loved one can access. Um, adult Protective Services, similar to Child Protective Services, they have a hotline, and I'll look it up before we end the webinar. I can give the Solano County Adult Protective Service number um, is a resource that people can call and get more information and support around. Um, they there's some interventions that can be put into place to support, you know, the person experiencing dementia and the one that's trying to support them. Okay, thank you. Um... So the next question is around resources for trans and LGBTQIA um, individuals and how they may find resources available um, to deal with IPV. Do we have specific resources or guidance for them? Um, I don't know if I have any specific resources. Um, I know that like in Oakland specifically, um, there's like a lot of LGBTQ centers that provide resources. I'm not exactly sure for Solano County, but I could look into that. Um, but the LGBTQ community does experience intimate partner violence at honestly at higher rates than um, like straight people um, or non-trans people. Um, because of, I think it's, and people don't acknowledge it because I think there's just so many um, layered things. And there's also so many different types of harm that affect like queer and trans people specifically, um, like in the form of like dead naming, um, outing people, things like that. Um, so I would have to look specifically for more like exact resources on um, intimate partner violence specifically, but I do think, um, not I do think, a lot of these other organizations provide resources to everyone. Um, and a lot of these organizations are like working really hard to try to be more comprehensive. Um, I know at FBLC, we're trying, working hard to be more comprehensive in like our language and the ways that we're addressing these issues. 
um, and like the lens that we're working through. So um, I know that at FBLC, we have hired more queer people who are able to like, uh, as advocates who are able to more closely relate to some of the issues um, within the LGBTQ community. Um, yes, so that's what I know about that. And I would say the same, uh, the resources that have been provided um, is the, there's a lot of diversity in who are, who our victims are um, accessing resources and services. You know, the different agencies are also recruiting representatives from each group to provide that support, but it's under the same umbrella of services. Okay, thank you. So what are some of the abusive behaviors that may appear to be more lethal? Um, choking is something that um, leads to homicide more often um, in physical behaviors. Um, stalking is something that is also um, a behavior to really be aware and mindful of if that is happening. Um, so those are the two that from what we've seen um, are the ones. And also like if the, her, if the abuser has access to weapons, um, to guns, so that like calls on to like gun control and like that's a whole different topic, but um, that is also another form uh, if the abuser has access to weapons, those situations tend to be more lethal as well. Okay. Um, then our last question for the evening, how does drug abuse and alcoholism affect intimate partner violence? Uh, it can play a pretty key role um, because uh, it's a mood altering, you know, substance that's being consumed. And the abuser then has, you know, can use that as a scapegoat as to their behaviors and the different actions. Um, and then there are oftentimes where abusers only commit that physical violent act while under the influence. Um, and if they're not seeking treatment and, you know, um, has a habitual substance abuse problem, then the prevalence of physical violence and abuse is higher. Okay, thank you. So again, I'd like to thank Naomi Ford for this very comprehensive presentation, uh, Rosalind Gentry, and to all of our members of the physical and mental health. Thank you so much for this first discussion on Crimson Conversations. It was very informative. I have so many more questions, um, <laughs> but I know we're limited on time. To our social action com uh, committee, thank you so much for providing that social action component. Um, before we let you all go, we would like for you to um, complete this out evaluation. You can scan the QR code and your, the evaluation form will come up for you. Um, when we get into 2024, we will continue this conversation. Um, obviously you won't necessarily hear what you heard tonight. However, it is recorded and we will be adding it not only to our website, but to our YouTube channel. So we encourage you to continue to follow Vallejo Alumni Chapter. You can find us on Instagram as well as Facebook. But if you would complete this evaluation form, this will help us prepare for the next session on Crimson Conversations. So with that, we will let you go this evening. Have a blessed holiday season. And remember, if you need resources, they are available. Thank you so much for attending.